NACDL is the association of the nation's criminal defense bar. My name is Nathan Adams. I work for a DNA consulting firm out of Dayton, Ohio. We do uh, just forensic biology consulting. So people call us up, say, I got DNA in my case. Uh, what do we need to look at? Are there any issues with it? That kind of thing. Uh, my background is actually in computing. Uh, it's in bioinformatics. So the, the using computing tools to solve biological questions, or at least try to get a better idea of them. And I found myself doing uh, forensic DNA work, which has actually coincided with a big uptick in the use of software to solve forensic DNA questions. Before we do get started, um, since I don't do any work out of Philly, and not a whole lot out of Pennsylvania, honestly, um, I don't think I know anybody here. And I don't know what your guys' experience is with DNA. Have you all had a case involving DNA? OK. Many, it looks like. OK. Are they mostly out of, is it a city lab, state police? City lab. City lab. Jersey, OK. New York City. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> um, they're, uh, all right. So um, that's great to hear. So, so you guys know the basic vocab. OK. I don't uh, want to spend a whole lot of time on that then. And I think that would uh, gives you guys, that means you guys have the tools that, that you need to ask questions. Um, if there, you want to go a little bit further down than it sounds like we're going, don't be afraid to say back up. And let's talk about that a little bit more. So, um, so it sounds like you, you should all be familiar with, with the basic stages of DNA analysis. You got to get the sample in the lab. Once you, get the, once you get the evidence items in the lab, you need to identify, sorry, I don't want to block the screen or carry. Um, so I'm going to fidget around until I find a sweet spot. Um, you got to get the evidence in the lab. And then the lab needs to determine whether uh, the items that the investigator, the police, thought were probative actually could be probative. They need to get the samples uh, for the biological materials for ser serological testing or DNA off those items, then send them through the process of actually developing a DNA profile. And these are going to be consistent from lab to lab. So I'm talking to everybody throughout this whole presentation. I tried to make this very general, especially since I don't have Philly PD. Is that who does the DNA testing here? OK. Um, and that's something that I'm, I am happy to talk to you guys about. If you do have particular questions about your lab's protocols, the uh, weird things that you've seen in casework. If you do want to pull me aside, I am here. Uh, I'm talking, obviously, right now. I'll be here tomorrow, and uh, but I'm not talking tomorrow. And then I'll uh, be doing one of the workshops with Carrie on Sunday, or the small sessions, the focus sessions, whatever those are called. So I will be around if you do have particular things that you want to talk about. Um, so you should all be familiar with uh, an electropharogram. If you are not, this is uh, the ultimate end goal of the DNA testing process. It is not the end of the DNA analysis process, but this is the data that an analyst or increasingly a computer program has been brought online to use. Actually, quick question. Has Philly PD brought on probabilistic genotyping? They have not yet, but you are aware of it. OK. All right. OK, like I said, I'm a computer guy. So when computer software is being used, um, it's something not that I'm excited to hear necessarily, but uh, it is certainly interesting. So we have uh, this is one dye lane off of an electropharogram. This is a PowerPlex Fusion profile. What test kit do you guys have in Philly? Identifiler, Global. PowerPlex 16. Global Filer. Global Filer. OK. So this is the chief commercial competitor. This is the other company's uh, answer to Global Filer. It uh, tests the FBI's new 20 locus minimum criteria for doing database entries. Uh, and that's what uh, some of these slides are, are from the materials that we're going to be going over on Sunday. We're not going to go into the depth that we would on Sunday. But um, 
the PowerPlex Fusion has uh, five dyes and tests 23, 24 locations on, on the human genome. And the profile, uh, for example, at this D3 locus, 1417, at the D1, 1517.3, um, is going to, to be used to uh, associate it with, to see if it could be associated with a particular person, if that's a reasonable explanation of the evidence, if that person also has a 14, 15, 17, 15, 17.3. 17 um, but in order to get there, we got to go through a lot of stages. And uh, I'm going to be emphasizing, I'm going to be talking about things that it sounds like a lot of you are familiar with in terms of the DNA testing process, but uh, hopefully I'm going to be emphasizing things that you either knew were going on or are recent uh, developments in the field. Especially if you work with just one lab, you might not be aware necessarily of what other labs are doing, where the state of the field currently is or where it's heading. There's about 200 forensic DNA labs in the United States alone. Everybody does things a little bit differently. And uh, I don't know if Philly is a generally good lab a uh, generally not so great lab somewhere in the middle, but um, <clears throat> if you do share information insights with me, I'm, I'm certainly happy to talk about that. Um, this is the full profile for this PowerPlex Fusion. Uh, this is a, a reference sample. That, that's going to be the single source profile that's generated from uh, a buccal swab in this particular case. And uh, it's going to be used to, as a comparison, to any evidentiary items that uh, the laboratory, perhaps on request from the police or the, the prosecutor, um, to compare a particular person to that evidentiary item. And we can, if we look at all of the peaks, we see that most loci have two peaks. Most locations on the, the genome have two alleles. That's from each copy of uh, the chromosomes that we have. We have pairs of all of our chromosomes except for men have one X and one Y at amylogenin. Uh, there are loci with uh, just a single peak, this Penta D locus, which Global Filer does not test for, but, but this one does. So that's homozygous, two copies of the same allele. Both chromosomes have the same uh, genetic information on them. Down here, uh, if you've looked at a couple global filer profiles, you should be familiar that they have uh, Y chromosome DNA as well. Since this is a male profile, you'll see a peak at the DY loci. This particular kid only has one uh, Y chromosome locus. It is not included in statistics. So that can be confusing how some of the things from this genotype do not make it all the way into the statistical calculations. Uh, but it, it's used for information to try to differentiate, to see if there's multiple men who have contributed to a sample. So this is a, a random match probability. This is something that has come around in the past year or two as labs have transitioned to these new test kits like Global Filer or Fusion. You see words like nonillion, whereas before we might have seen things like quadrillion, quintillion, billion, trillion, words that we're actually more familiar with because we maybe don't encounter them on a daily basis, but hear about them on the news or whatnot. Um, typically, uh, the only people I hear talking in the non-aliens are like astronomers talking about the numbers of atoms in the universe or whatever. I don't know. Um, but we're, we're talking about them here, and it's very difficult for people to relate to these things. And honestly, I don't have a great way to make that number relatable. This number has 30 zeros after the three, so that's, it, it's tough. It's a reality of the world that we live in. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, some of the calculations that you might have seen in the past, and that you, it sounds like you are still seeing today in the absence of probabilistic genotyping. And then we will get towards uh, the language of probabilistic genotyping later, and a couple of issues that, that are surrounding the use of that software. But um, this might be familiar to you. This is uh, a profile that has three alleles at several loci. So this D3 locus has a 14, a 15, and a 17 labeled. And this D2 locus has four peaks that are labeled, <laughs> indicating that since each person has only one or two alleles at a locus, this is a mixture of at least two people. 
Uh, so uh, do you understand where we're coming from with the peaks and, and the labels? I, I did over a lot, assuming that everybody had, had gone through DNA cases and was familiar with loci and, and alleles and peaks and electropherograms and stuff like that. So we can spend five minutes now to, to just go over what this actually is. Um, so we have uh, all of these different locations. Each one of these is a different location on the human genome. And since we're 99.9% .9 similar genetically, each of us is identical to the other one for 99.9% .9 of our genome, we have to find the little bits of differences. If we want to use this information to uh, form a conclusion about identity. And we look at these locations that we have identified that medical science, biological science, has identified throughout our, our genome in order to say this person uh, does not match this particular sample. Because when we looked at the D16 or the tho one locus, information that they have in their genome was not present on that sample. So this entire chart is a very small representation of all of the genetic information in each of our cells. And since each of our cells that has a nucleus, at least, um, has two copies of uh, each chromosome, we're going to have one or two alleles. This is uh, simply a readout of all possible alleles along this line. And wherever we see a peak, we know that if there's a peak in this location, it is indicative of a 14 allele. And we call it a 14 because at each of these locations that we're looking at, there are repeats, 14 repeats, of a small pattern of DNA. So most of these are five nucleotides, A's, G's, C's, and T's, that, that compose the whole genome. How so, accurate is that? How accurate is, is a 14 a 14, or is a 14 maybe a 13? How accurate are, are readings, period? How, how accurate are, how is this information? Be, how close does it need to be to be accurate? So we've gotten pretty, we're, we're, we've gotten really good at, uh, sorry, the question was, how good is reading these samples? We've gotten really good at developing profiles from a buccal swab, from a blood stain, from uh, something taken directly from an individual. If there's a lot of DNA, then there's a lot of information. These peaks are tall. We're confident that they're tall. They're not low-level peaks down there. So we're pretty good if you get a buccal swab or uh, a blood draw from somebody. As the quantity of DNA decreases, the age of that sample, if time, um, different factors have degraded the sample, then these peaks are going to get smaller. If you add more people to that sample, there's going to be more peaks. Maybe it's hard to pull out who contributed what portion of the DNA. So there's a lot of factors that complicate this. We're really good at doing buccal swabs. We're less good at doing two-person mixtures, where it looks like two people might have contributed different amounts. Because we are stacking, it, it, it looks like we probably can separate who's in this particular mixture, at least for this dye lane. Or if we can't do that, maybe for this low guy, because he's got these really short peaks, maybe not all of his peaks actually showed up. Maybe, maybe some of them are too close to the baseline for us to see that. Um, and maybe, maybe he has a peak here at this 15, but we can only see that because the guy who gave most of the DNA has a 14 and a 17. What if the guy who gave most of the DNA had a 15 too? that 15 would be masked by that tall 15. They stack on top of each other. We can't tell a 15 from a 15 from a 15. So it, it is easier for us to pull out the major contributor who contributed most of the DNA than it is for us to pull out the minor contributor. Now what happens if two people contributed a little bit of DNA? So now we have one guy who gave a lot and two people who gave a little. Eventually, it's going to be hard for us to make any conclusions at all. And I'm hopefully going to, to be telling you when, where those lines are, where it becomes difficult. So at, at some point, interpreting these results is going to become unreliable. And my hope is that at the end of this hour, hour and a half, is that you, you know a little bit more of where those lines lie. And when conclusions and statements about uh, different analyses have been made, whether you should say, OK, well, 
that's the case, or you can push back. We don't. We don't know that to be true that the 14 and the 17 came from the same person. The more locations that we look at, the more confident we are that we're getting a good picture of this. If we look at 20 locations and we never see more than two tall peaks, it might be a reasonable conclusion to say that, that this probably came from a single person. If we see 19 locations where there's no more than two tall peaks, and then there's a 20th location with three tall peaks, then something's funny going on because there's not many people who have three copies of any allele. They don't have three chromosomes that uh, most people don't. So something's going on. There's either two people in that mixture or that person has, has some sort of genetic mutation. And then we go from, from there. So that's the idea. And sorry, sir, so what, what these peaks mean, these are correlated with, with the quantity of DNA that was in the original sample. The taller the peak, generally that means the more DNA that you originally had to work with. So if you're swabbing a, a gigantic puddle of blood, you're likely to have a huge amount of DNA to work with. You should be getting very tall, reliable peaks. If you're swabbing a, the handle of a gun, then maybe you're only going to get a couple cells off that. You might not be looking at such a clear, clear profile. Uh, so the question is about shedding DNA. Different people uh, lose their, their skin cells at different rates. That's something we should talk about later. That's outside the scope of this. But uh, it's a great question. If somebody gave a 14 and a 17 here, and they gave a lot, there's tall peaks, should uh, they also be giving a large quantity of DNA at D1? Uh, uh, so everything but red blood cells and sperm cells in the human body will have a complete copy of our genome. Red blood cells don't have a nucleus, so there's, there's no, none of this type of DNA. And sperm cells and eggs have uh, only half, they only have one set of chromosomes each. So in all of our other cells, skin cells, brain cells, whatever cells, you're gonna have the same amount of, what, you're gonna have one copy of the 14 allele and the 17 allele at this location. You're gonna have one copy of this and that at D1, on and on and on through all of the locations, every point in your genome, and, unless there's a mutation, which are pretty rare. I, I've seen like two, I've been working here for five years. The heights will not change depending on the, the tissue source of the DNA, assuming it's a pristine sample. Some types of, of DNA that's been shed and environmental factors can cause a degradation of, of the peak heights. So the question is about these small peaks down here, and there are artifacts associated with the testing processes that can generate peaks. They can affect uh, the artifacts of the testing process, the stochastic effects, can change the height of these peaks, because the 14 and 17, you'd think that they would be exactly the same height if we contributed the same quantity, but there's going to be imbalances in the heights of these peaks, there's going to be small peaks down here, and that's going to be something that is uh, hopefully well-studied processes of, of the DNA testing process. So uh, some of these peaks, these short ones that are immediately followed by a tall peak, these short ones that don't have labels that immediately have a tall peak after them, those are, are called stutter. It is uh, an artifact of the copying process. We start with a small amount of DNA and we got to make copies of it. We got to uh, amp it up so that we can get signal, so that we can get these nice tall peaks. But one of the artifacts of that is sometimes we don't copy it with 100% fidelity. Sometimes when we're copying a 14, we only copy four, or 13 of those repeat units. So it, it, the, the question is, is that a weakness in the testing process that, that can be exploited on, on cross-examination? Stutter is, is well studied, it's well known, and it's one of those things that people are going to say is well accounted for. So if you have imperfections in any process, but you study and can account for those imperfections, those uncertainties, then people are going to claim that that is therefore a reliable, um, a reliable approach to an imperfect process. So the answer is yes. The answer, the answer is, uh, wh what do you make of this tall peak right here that's right before the 14 that we took the label off because we think it's stutter, we think it's not really an allele from a person? And then there's a shorter 15 right here. That, that, that's the answer to your question. This 15 isn't, isn't a stutter. That, that's another person's DNA that was contributed to the sample. So, so now we have the difficulty of trying to interpret one person's DNA amongst the artifacts of the testing process. Um, so there, there's going to be a difference between subjectivity in 
that particular analyst's ability to use discretion and subjectivity built into the protocol itself. So if the protocol of the lab says, if this peak qualifies for these criteria, then we're not going to put a label on it. We're not going to call it a 13 peak. It, we're, kidding, we're calling it a stutter peak off of the 14, a stutter artifact off of the 14, then that's what that analyst has to do. If the protocols say, uh, well, with discretion, the analyst can interpret those peaks in stutter position that meet these criteria, even though we think it's probably a stutter peak, with analyst discretion or the approval of your technical leader or something like that, if they give them an out to say, usually that's what we would say, but in this particular case, I thought about it, I asked people around in my lab, that, that's where the, the difficulty, that's where the subjectivity often comes in. This is definitely uh, an issue if we're saying there are artifacts that have stronger signal than, than the minor contributor, the, the low level profile that we're trying to interpret. And this is very common, you know, if, especially in touch samples, if somebody's trying to swab a, a doorknob or a steering wheel or something like that for uh, a stolen car or something like that, maybe the driver's DNA is all over the place. So the, the question was about um, blue gene dye can uh, so, so the circumstances or the substance, the material that the DNA was recovered from can contain chemicals that can affect the testing process as well. That's absolutely true. Blue gene dye is a known inhibitor of developing DNA profiles. Yeah, th there's, there's many chemicals that can interfere with the, the processes that the DNA goes through in the laboratory. This so this is, this is my, my joy that, you know, this is what gets me interested in up in the morning is when laboratories are interpreting these low-level complex mixtures. So we have a lot of peaks. They're very low. This is, by the way, this is the, the high peak is measured in relative fluorescent units, RFUs. It is a somewhat arbitrary designation of uh, how intense the signal, these peak signal uh, is. We like to see uh, peaks that are 1,000, 2,000 RFUs tall. Those are generally more reliable, less subject to these artifacts and stochastic processes. Uh, but these are very low level. We have 150, 150. And this dotted line that I drew is, uh, as an example, this laboratory's analytical threshold, they do not interpret peaks shorter than 50 RFUs. So you see peaks down here. There's what might be DNA signal down here that the lab's not interpreting, but maybe they tried to interpret things up top. And that's what you need to look out for. So um, if you see these low level mixtures, if you see peaks below this threshold, then uh, that's definitely a red flag and you need to start thinking about artifacts. You need to think about how many people are in the sample, how reliable are the laboratory's interpretation protocols, are they even set for this or do they have to go out of bounds, get supervisor approval? You know, there's no, there's no law in nature that you can get your supervisor's approval for, right? And we're studying these natural biological factors. So anytime somebody has to do that, it always gets me concerned. It's not like asking for a new computer or something like that. This is something that's supposed to be established scientific protocol is tricky when, when you need to ask for, for input so um, or permission to go outside. So these are, are just some general categories of, of how I think about uh, these controversial topics that we're going over. Some things are, are blatantly not, not founded in any scientific process. They're not a conclusion of a scientific, you know, formulate your hypothesis, test your hypothesis, evaluate how well, you know, the data fit revisit your hypothesis, retest, that, that kind of thing that, that we went over in the eighth grade, right? Um, th there's many things in this field that, that just don't adhere to that basic scientific uh, set of principles. Some things are new and haven't been sufficiently tested. Some things are based in science, but they might be partial answers, but you're not told that they're not the complete answer. So there's the risk of people assuming that this is the end-all, be-all explanation of, of the, the sample, the data, the scenario that you're considering. And then, you know, our lovely friend, bias, a dirty word in science.
So this is, uh, you were supposed to get my boss, Dr. Crane, but unfortunately he had a conflict. So I brought him here in spirit. This is one of his favorite things. So the case narrative provided by the lab was, I asked how they got their suspect. He is a convicted rapist and the MO matches the former rape. The suspect was recently released from prison and works in the same building as the victim. She was afraid of him. Also, his demeanor was suspicious when they brought him in for questioning. He also fits the general description of the man witnesses saw leaving the area on the night they think she died. So I said, you basically have nothing to connect him directly with the murder unless we find his DNA. He said, yes. So, you know, and none of it was relevant. You know, everybody has DNA. It doesn't matter if it was nighttime, daytime, black, white, in a restaurant, in an apartment, whatever, it, it's all gonna be the same thing. So there are, the argument for hearing this case narrative is so the, the laboratory doesn't undergo expensive, unnecessary testing. The other argument is <clears throat> maybe they only test the things that they think are gonna implicate a particular person. So that balance is delicate and there's often little input from uh, the person that they suspect or at least ultimately come to suspect in terms of what items are tested. There is some, uh, it, it seems like now there, there's a little bit more opportunity for testing. Sometimes that's post-conviction testing, but at least the opportunity is there at some point for people to have input on what items get tested, what tests are actually undertaken, who conducts the testing, things like that. So that is a conversation, um, you know, if additional things do need to get tested, it's not something that we, we uh, refer people to testing. We don't have a testing lab. We, we just do consulting. We don't refer people to additional testing very often, either repeat testing of the same item or additional testing of other items. But it is a tool in the toolbox. So uh, I'd like to go over some things with serology. And I believe Carrie's going to visit on serology as well. So this isn't DNA testing. I told you that I was going to talk about controversies in DNA. But since serology, the identification of uh, bodily tissues, uh, bodily fluids, this is uh, going to be done by the same unit generally in most labs, the forensic biology unit. So if they're looking for uh, an identification of is this blood, is this saliva, is this semen, what, what's the source of this bodily fluid, <clears throat> they're going to send it to uh, the serologist. Uh, or the DNA analyst might do serology testing as well. I don't know how, how the PD works here, um, or the, the police department lab. So that's great. They gave you guys the same acronym. I bet you you love that. Um, so there are presumptive tests, and there are confirmatory tests. Presumptive tests will uh, ding on a positive result. A positive presumptive test, uh, or presumptive test for blood will produce a positive result for blood it will also produce a positive result for things that aren't blood. Uh, some of these things, depending on the test, and there's a variety of tests for uh, each of the substances that we test for. There's not a single test. You can see the acronyms down here. And uh, I didn't break them down, because I want you to look for acronyms, not know what they are, and then go and Google them, or ask someone, or open a book, and then try to figure out what the false positives for it are different false positives occur for different things. Some things are, uh, like we were talking about, blue gene dye can inhibit the DNA testing process. Well, sometimes horseradish sauce makes people think that there's blood or saliva on an item. Um, or not necessarily horseradish sauce, but I don't know many horseradish farmers who just have horseradish sitting on them. Um, there's a, a variety of, of other plant uh, matter, household chemicals, and other body, body fluids that are not the one that somebody's looking for. Sometimes uh, saliva can get uh, a test for saliva can also be triggered by uh, vaginal secretions. So if they're looking to see if there was forced oral sex on someone to, and, and they have a sample containing vaginal secretions, that can cause a positive test for what they're calling a saliva test which is difficult. And it's difficult to differentiate those things, which requires a, a validation study. So you got a positive blood test. You're talking about inconclusives, but, but 
if you got a positive blood test, if it's presumptive, which is an indication that there are non-blood substances that cause a false positive, that is a positive result on a blood test that's not for blood. So some non-blood substance caused, caused it. If you have a positive result on a presumptive test, you need to figure out what those other non-blood substances are. And where do you find that? You gotta find that in papers. The, the journal articles that are written about serological testing. And it sucks, you know, <laughs> to, to, read, to read journal articles that you're not interested in reading. But Some of it, there, there's like four, four or five substances that, that people look for to see if they can identify the tissue source in addition to the DNA present. Yeah. I was gonna say, some of this stuff is gonna depend on your case. Like I had one guy um, who was charged with murder, they, when they pull him over, he's got blood on him. But I'm from, you know, I represent people all over the state of Ohio, and he was like, I was just hunting and we loaded the deer in the back of the truck. So in that particular case, these presumptive blood tests are going to be meaningful. It might not mean something if you've got this entire pool of your victim's blood on the floor, and you're not saying you, that person didn't die there. But you know, you have to think about, like, for your particular case, when does this matter? And a lot of times, the presumptive tests for, like, on your sex offenses, yeah. um, you know, they said that he performed cunnilingus on the four-year-old. Well, you know, you have a presumptive, let's say, AP test but they don't do anything else. And your prosecutor is gonna to try to argue that your client, you know, that's your client's DNA there, um, or that's your, you know, that's the fluid left by your client. Well, that's not what the test says. And knowing what other things that test can come from is gonna be really important for a motion in limine for cross-examination. So that's kind of why we're, he's talking through all of these alternative sources of some of these serological fluids. We're not talking about DNA yet, okay? That makes sense. Okay. It, it, and a, a lot of the game is uh, evaluating the alternative explanations for how the test results came to be. Because, you know, just omitting the idea that there's multiple ways that these test results or DNA test results could come to be is, I think, really one of the biggest weaknesses of, of the current state of forensic uh, biology. So this is a good slide, and you guys are gonna get this this presentation to go over and, and revel in the hour and a half that you had with Nathan Adams talking at you. Um, each of these is a different conclusion. Uh, the test was positive, or their presumed blood was identified. Presumed blood is not the same thing as confirmed blood. It's not, we know it's blood. It's not the same, confirmed blood sometimes doesn't have anything before blood, it just says blood. Sometimes labs will put presumed blood without a qualifier on it, leaving you to believe that they actually identified a substance that is blood and could only be blood on that object. And it's not even saying that it's human blood. Like Carrie said, you know, maybe it's deer blood. Maybe it's a it's, uh, guy shot a rabbit out back. I don't know what people shoot in Philly, but you guys fish in the river? So, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, but if there is an opportunity for non-human blood to be involved, some of these tests will uh, be positive on meat. So, guy dribbled hamburger juice all over himself, having, uh, or a Philly cheesesteak, is that actually a big thing here? Or is that just a tourist thing? It's just a tourist thing. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so, what was tested for? What, what does that test give positive results for? Is it different than what the lab <laughs> is stating in their lab report? Are they just giving you one thing that the, the test is positive for? And this is often the only indication that you will get that serological testing was performed. This worksheet has those acronyms that I showed you. And there's no testing conducted in this case, but you'll just see a plus or a minus in, in these boxes. That's oftentimes the only thing that you, you will see, the only indication that the lab conducted any testing for blood or saliva or semen or, or what have you. There's no obligation for them to, to conduct that, that <laughs> testing. Um, they, uh, it, and, and it's left up to someone else to say, hey, wait a minute, these results aren't exclusive to what your, the, the one verb or, or noun or whatever word that is, blood. You know, they're not exclusive to blood. They're not exclusive to semen. And I will say too, um, it's really, and we'll talk about this later, but 
can be important for you to get your lab's protocols as to how they determine those particular things. Because if the analyst doesn't do what their actual lab's protocols are, then it starts to become more interesting for you. If your lab's protocols are terrible um, and they don't do what some, you know, the standards on serology is a little all over the place, but if they're just doing, you know, an alternative light source and AP test, well, that's on, on you know, biological fluids, well, that's terrible. Um, so um, you guys have probably heard about DNA transfer. You know, uh, it, I shook a guy's hand and he touched the gun kind of explanation. So just the same way, serological, uh, serological tests can't differentiate between materials that were transferred through innocent means and through, through criminal means. Um, this is uh, my lovely, lovely artwork. If you can't tell, uh, there's a DNA, a helix in the blood drop. And this is symbolizing uh, a positive result. This, this blood drop is a positive result for, for a test for a serological blood test. And this DNA is gonna be ultimately what's developed into a DNA profile. So this is something containing DNA that caused a positive result on a blood test. And so we got a presumed blood positive result, and then we got a DNA profile off of that. So the conclusion is naturally, we got DNA from the blood. But we cannot differentiate these results from this scenario where something causing a positive result for a serological test was deposited in a separate event from the DNA onto the same area of, I say the cardboard box, there was a case where we had uh, a riot and a store window got kicked in, someone stole some shoes, allegedly, of course, when I'm talking to public defenders, <laughs> and there was a uh, a positive presumptive blood test for material on a cardboard box that was in the, the display window that no longer contained shoes. And a DNA profile was developed. And the laboratory was not explaining how, what was certainly not volunteering, how these two test results could arise from two different scenarios. And that was uh, due to the, the strength the quality of the DNA profile and the, the strength of the positive presumptive test result, it was a legitimate question. It was a small amount of claimed blood. It was a small amount of, of DNA. Could it be that there was another cause for that presumptive test result and that guy just happened to be in that store a week ago and left his DNA on the box? So that's uh, an alternative explanation for the data that was produced. The, the positive result for a presumptive test certainly could be blood. Um, I mean, that's why they selected the test in the first place. They're not just, you know, doing the, uh, what's those magic marker coloring books? You know, like they didn't just make up a test and say, oh, hey, you know, I got a color change, so, so it's what I think it is. Like there's a legitimate basis for them saying that it's possibly blood but it's possibly also other things. The, the question is, is the scenario, the alternative scenario put forth, some other guy's blood where we didn't get his DNA, and then my guy's, my guy's DNA that wasn't from blood? Or was it non-blood causing the positive test result plus my guy's DNA? It was the latter. It was a non-blood false positive for that test. Um, it, it's tough to walk around how somebody else's blood wouldn't have their DNA in it. They don't, they don't do blood typing very frequently at all anymore. Um, because of, of the power of identity of a DNA profile, if we're saying non-aliens, then what's the significance of having the same blood type as 20% of the population? So at the, the extraction stage, this is just a reminder this is less controversial, this, this particular part, less controversial, but you should follow your samples through the paperwork to ensure that your guy's buccal swab was not extracted at the same time or before the evidence in the case. If there's a small amount of all of that DNA that they got off inside of his cheek, there's a chance that that small amount of DNA could have stuck on a scissors 
or a tabletop or something like that and then made its way onto the knife handle or the garbage bag or whatever they're testing, then that is a major opportunity for contamination. Um, you should also, and this is something that, that uh, I imagine Carrie will include in there, is corrective action reports if the laboratory should be keeping logs for accreditation reasons of when they find funny things like the analyst profile on the murder weapon, there should be uh, a log of that. Does your analyst have a history of contaminating samples? We had a case where um, an analyst was, was written up three times for sneezing on samples. And I, I'm an allergy sufferer, I get it, <laughs> but there's, there's, we had a case, like we were consulted on a case. Someone hired us to review the, the DNA materials. So, um, you know, that's something that, that never would have come to light. In, and the issue in the particular case, one of the issues they were addressing is the possibility of contamination occurring within the lab, small amounts of DNA making their way from uh, a reference sample, a buccal swab, to an evidentiary item. And if this person's so lax that she open mouth sneezes across her test tubes, the concern was maybe she's not that strict about other protocols. And, so, and we wouldn't have noticed that if we hadn't asked for and reviewed her corrective action reports. Uh, differential extraction is a very important one. Do they do that in Philly? Um, it's typically for a sex assault where they're trying to differentiate sperm cells from non-sperm cells. So yeah, so there's, there's the idea that Sperm cells are really dense. The idea is if you put uh, uh, material recovered from like a vaginal swab after a sexual assault, if sperm was present and you spin that test tube down, the sperm will go to the bottom of the tube and all of the non-sperm cells will be up above it. So the idea is that you can, you can break apart that uh, differential spin down extraction. So labs, especially in the past, would call those sperm fractions, the fraction of the DNA coming from sperm, and the fraction coming from epithelial cells, skin cells. So they would call it epithelial fraction, which would uh, ideally have exclusively the non-sperm uh, cells, a profile from just non-sperm cells, and a profile from sperm cells. Great idea in theory, doesn't always work. Spinning that stuff down, sometimes you'll get skin cells in the sperm fraction, sometimes you'll get sperm in the, the epithelial fraction. Uh, so it's much more appropriate, and many labs are moving to calling them F1 and F2 fractions. If your lab doesn't, that's something you should act, uh, actively ask them about. And if, especially if you guys are dealing with one particular lab and you get to know their protocols, they change their protocols, but they don't change them rapidly overnight usually. That might happen every couple of years. There's a smile in the back. <laughs> Sounds like there's a story behind that, but um, the... Uh, one thing that you can do is that more and more labs are posting their protocols online. So you can go to some lab that does post their protocols online and uh, ask the analyst about it. And maybe that's not on the stand. Maybe you just have a conversation with them or, or if you depose your analyst beforehand. Two, you can ask them about other labs' protocols. And sometimes they're just going to shrug and say, you know, we do things different. But sometimes there might be a little bit more of a narrative behind it, too. So um, the Quantitation of DNA as DNA uh, genotyping, as the technology has gone on, we've gotten better at amplifying small amounts of DNA, but we can't violate the laws of nature, and some of these things are going to be inherently problematic. One human cell contains seven picograms, and there's 1,000 picograms in a nanogram, which is one one billionth of a gram. So I, I try to conceptualize this every couple of months, and I have to start with a pile of, of sugar from a sugar packet that's like two grams of sugar, and then I divide that up into a thousand pieces, and then eventually I lose track of what I'm trying to think about. Um, it's a very, very small amount of material. Excuse me. One human cell contains seven picograms, six, seven picograms of DNA, and um, Shoot, I, I was going to include uh, 
something from one of the test kit manufacturers describing what amounts of DNA their test kit actually is designed to, to amplify. In the early 2000s, the test kits recommended that you amplify the equivalent of about 200 cells worth of DNA to get a reliable DNA profile. Nowadays, test kits will uh, say that you can reliably amplify fewer than 80. So the idea is that we've gotten more than twice as efficient at amplifying the DNA up. Um, the math isn't exact here if you're trying to get me on that. Um, the issue is once you get down to a certain number of cells, and, and this is typically the total amount of cells of every contributor to that sample. So if you've got a three-person mixture, then you're putting 80 cells from everybody in there. So maybe one guy contributed 40, another guy did 30, and then one guy is 10. And if we're getting down below 20 cells per person, we're especially vulnerable to stochastic effects some of those artifacts of the testing process that complicate uh, especially mixture interpretation. So if you're operating down at 125 picograms or fewer per person, then you are, you're at risk of uh, increased risk of stochastic effects. This is peaks not appearing where they should. Sometimes peaks appear where they shouldn't. Those peaks being in different height, maybe one peaks down below the threshold and one peaks above. All of these things are complicating factors for a human or a computer to interpret the samples. So yeah, OK, so I'm sorry. I forgot to come back and include a manual uh, image in there. But if you have Global Filer in your lab, you can Google Global Filer manual and download that 100-page beauty and Control F for optimal or recommended or nanogram or whatever, and try to figure out exactly on what page. You know, page 87 of the manufacturer's manual says you're supposed to use 750 picograms, but you only use 200 picograms. What, why, why didn't you use the manufacturer's recommended amount? What happens when you don't? You know, those kinds of questions are, are very relevant, and, and answers to them can affect how people perceive the the reliability of the conclusions. This is an example worksheet, and it's tough to read because um, it's so small. But you will typically get something that looks like uh, a spreadsheet, and it has columns of concentration, total amount. Sometimes you'll get total amounts of DNA. Some labs don't actually show you the result of all of their math. But they'll have, uh, so, so when we get the, the DNA off of the swab or off, off the cutting of the fabric, you need to get that into a solution. You have it in, a, in an aqueous, a watery solution. And that solution is we're going to determine the concentration of DNA per unit water in that solution. And then we're going to take x units of water that has y amounts of DNA in it. And then we're going to say that that's the amount that we want to get. So we have our target amount for this lab is 750 picograms, or 0.75 nanograms. So you can see for some of these samples, if you can see, we started with a lot of DNA, and we actually had to dilute it. We had so much DNA, we needed to dilute it, or we would overload our equipment. But um, starting with, with this quantity of DNA and diluting it allows us to amplify up our intended actual amount. But for these three top samples, we didn't get to the point where we had 0.75 nanograms of DNA. The, the laboratory put the maximum amount of, of sample into their machine that they could, but it still wasn't enough to get an optimal level, an optimized readout for that test kit to operate 100% reliably. So that's definitely something that, that you should be on the lookout for. If someone says you're using a suboptimal amount of DNA on your DNA test, you should expect those low peak heights. You should expect more problems with interpreting your sample. And that's not to say that, that these large quantity uh, samples don't have problems associated with it. It's just the lower amounts you start with, the more problems you tend to have. Uh, just in the interest of time, I think we're going to skip past these. Um, this is an indication of, of some um, stochastic effects that can happen. This is another slide I borrowed from Dr. Crane. Um, this is uh, a repeat with the lab going outside of their, their boundaries of testing. 
So we're supposed to see a 912 at one location, an 1112 at another, and then an 11 that looks like it might be a homozygous, a double stack, two copies of that 11. But when we went to a really low quantity, only eight picograms, that's just over one cell's worth of DNA, and, and ramped up our protocols, we missed that 12, but we got a 14 instead. That's a problem. The 11 appeared as we expected, but the 12 is significantly shorter than it. And we did get the 11. So we have a couple problems going on at those two loci. So just the smaller amounts of DNA and tweaking the protocols might allow you to get a DNA profile, even if it's not a reliable one. And when we're dealing with evidentiary items, the only reason we're testing these items is because we don't know whose DNA on, is on it. So we can't use circular logic and saying, oh, well, we got a reasonable result because we see who we thought we were going to see on there, right? We don't know whose DNA is on these items. Um, so this is a two-person mixture, 250 picograms. It's lower than 750, but it's not 125 except it turns out this is, this is a lab-made mixture, so we know how much DNA from each person went into it. It's a four-to-one mixture, so that means that one person gave about 200 picograms, and the other person only gave 50. So the person who gave 50, they're uh, only appearing at two loci, and uh, the major contributors' peaks are exhibiting peak height imbalance. This, these peaks are not... Uh, pretty similar in height. I'm sorry, the minor contributor only had one peak show up. And uh, one of the, the major contributor, even his failed to, to appear in the latter, uh, in the last location. So it, it can be problematic, definitely. This is, the lab made this mixture on their own intending to study mixtures and did not get reliable results. Like they started with pristine buccal swabs or blood draws mix this up in their laboratory. And, and they're supposed to, for validation purposes, they're supposed to do this. But it's a demonstration that even when they have control of all, all of the elements, sometimes mixtures that look like this, that have these characteristics, are not reliable. The, the question is, do all labs need to do mixtures for their validation studies? Purpose of validation studies is to demonstrate that your laboratory, using a particular process, can reliably generate results. And to know exactly where they fail to generate reliable results. So if they're interpreting three-person mixtures, but they've never generated a three-person mixture of known composition and successfully interpreted it correctly, then I'd have to ask what criteria their qualifications are based on. If you can't say for these known samples, I came up with these conclusions, then why would I trust you to come up with those conclusions in a case where you don't know the answers? So same validation studies and proficiency testing. I ask a lot of questions. So I mean, that's, that's what I do is I, I ask a lot of questions like that, as opposed to coming up with competing answers. And one of the reasons is we shouldn't have a lot of steadfast uh, one answer covers all kind of thing in this field. So, so lowering noise means this baseline, this is an old electropherogram, which you can, you can visibly see this noise uh, where there's no allelic peaks, it's just static, like on your TV or radio. And this is a new test kit, a newer test kit, where you, can, you can't even see the noise on the baseline. It's uh, a whole lot lower noise. So this means people are now looking closer to the baseline. And this is, uh, oh, excuse me. So this is the low-level sample with the, the modern test kit, and this is an old negative control, or this is the negative control for that modern test kit. But this is a locus within that negative control that has that low baseline. So since this old baseline is so dirty, we uh, didn't want to go very close to it, interpreting peaks real low level. But now that we have cleaner, less noisy baselines, people are more confident that when they interpret things close to the baseline, it's not actually noise. The problem with that is the lower the peaks you're interpreting, the more chance you are to, the higher chance you have of experience stochastic effects is a negative control. So what is this peak doing here in a negative control? This is supposed to 
be a, a DNA test that has no DNA in it. It's supposed to be just baseline. So if we are dropping our threshold down to interpret lower and lower peaks because we're not afraid of the noise so much, that means that we're increasing our opportunity to look at DNA that has, uh, originates from a low quantity, from that suboptimal quantity, and is subject to stochastic effects. So we're getting close, aren't we? Um, so this is the same low level sample and at a different locus. That, that first locus looked all right, but we can see here that we've lowered the baseline, but it's not so low that we'll get a label on this peak. We're not confident that's a real peak. So that looks like a real peak, and it would be a reasonable, reasonable conclusion to think that it is, but it failed to amplify sufficiently. I'm not saying that's the only conclusion, but that's a reasonable conclusion. So now we're faced with the prospect of, sure, we can look at these lower peaks, but we're not looking at all of them. And when we do, sometimes the ones that we expect to see don't show up. So this is uh, the statistical analysis where we're going to interpret an evidentiary item and try to see if somebody's present in it. So these are questions that um, we should be asking. So could the person of interest, it's usually the defendant, but sometimes there's evidence that's probative if the victim or somebody else was, was recovered from it, their DNA was recovered. So oftentimes, um, well, every time we're asking a statistic, the statistic is an expression of the probability or the likelihood that the DNA could have originated from somebody else, and we're just confusing it for the defendant's DNA. What's the chance of that happening? If it's a one in two chance, and that's, that's awful. But if it's a one in non-million chances, then we sh we're supposed to feel more comfortable with it. So how did you evaluate the data? This is crucial. If you guys don't have probabilistic genotyping in Philly now, you likely will soon. And after probabilistic genotyping, we're going to get next-gen sequencing. So maybe it's not next year. It might be three years, five years from now. But these changes are constantly coming. So we got to keep asking, even if you guys do 20, 50 DNA cases and you feel super confident, we always got to be on our toes. And we're forced to be on our toes because we see casework from all different labs. So if we haven't seen something in two years, we have a good suspicion, a reasonable su suspicion that something major has changed in that lab. So we are guided by, you asked about standards, ma'am. We're guided by uh, the FBI quality assurance standards. These are things that labs have to adhere to, that if they don't, they lose their accreditation. And well, nothing really happens after that. People like the idea that labs are accredited, but DNA is one of the unique forensic science disciplines where labs are exclusively accredited. And if you go to an unaccredited lab, the first question is, like, why would you possibly do that? Um, there are a couple private labs that are selectively non-accredited because they don't have faith in the accreditation process, um, which I would love to sit down and have a beer with that conversation. Um, but we have guidance documents from the National Organization, SWIGDAM, and the International Association Guiding Forensic Biology, ISFG. They come out with guidance documents. They are not mandatory to adhere to. They are that very comfortable thing for the field. If you're confronting them with something they don't like to hear from SWIGDAM, then they'll say, well, they're just guidance documents. We do it different. And then if you're confronting them with something else, they'll say, well, Swigdam <coughs> says so. So that's in that, that really loosey-goosey idea of guidance documents. Published literature, it's, it's uncomfortable for a scientist to say, I understand that you read that in a journal article, but it's entirely wrong. Scientists don't, you know, typically don't like calling other scientists, typically don't. <laughs> like calling other scientists outright liars or frauds or, or their conclusions were unfounded. Um, and there is perhaps not entirely deserved idea that peer-reviewed literature makes this, the conclusions more true. Um, it's important to me to keep in mind that, that peer-reviewed articles are novel and interesting, 
and not on their face wrong, but it's certainly not something that uh, means that anything published in a journal is true. But they are uh, one of the best sources for information. So your laboratory also needs to conduct their own internal validation studies. So these manufacturers of new methods or technologies will publish journal articles typically to demonstrate, to show this to the world, to say, I came up with this new system. I came up with this new um, process. Here it is. Here's how I proved that it's generally reliable. Then that lab, when they adopt that technology, they need to perform their own study to show that not only, you know, we understand that this one guy can do it in his lab or this one company can do it in theirs, but you need to show us that here in this city, in this lab, you can do it as well. So we have, in 2009, the National Research Council came out with strengthening forensic science, which was um, damning for forensic science across the board. Um, DNA was the least scathed, but still there were recommendations for, for many things to change. Calls for standards to be made. 2009, calls for standards. In 2017, the Department of Justice, I believe, oops, dismantled the <laughs> National Commission on Forensic Science. NIST has uh, their OSAC committees to develop standards and a non-government entity, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, Academy Standards Board, they are developing their standards as well. So it's taken us nine years, but we finally got to the point where we're working on it. Swig Dam, over its history, has grown their interpretation guidelines for standard traditional DNA guidance from a whole three pages, and that's if you print it off on the website with like wide margins, so maybe it's more like two pages in 2000. It grew to 28 pages in 2010, and then 90 pages last year. They came out with a new GOT document. Um, I don't know what they're going to come out with next. Like, there's nothing on this track that makes me think that 90's it. That's all we need, fellas. Pack it up. We're done. We figured out how to do DNA. It's clearly complex, and we keep coming back year after year and adding. These are not descriptions of new things happening. These are, hey, we figured out these things are happening. Here's my new explanation. DNA you know, has been around for a while, but, but we're still learning apparently 87 pages worth of interpretation guidelines over 17 years. So uh, these are the source of the random match. Does Philly do com CPI likelihood ratios, or they still do CPI? Yeah. That's, that's going out. It's, it's on its way out. Thankfully. Um, skip over some other things in time, or for time, the random match. Uh, so I barely got to talk about probabilistic genotyping, and that's, I got three minutes to talk about my favorite thing. Um, so that 90 page of, of SWIGDAM, that 28 pages of SWIGDAM 2010, uh, I can't tell you where it is in the new one, but in the 2010 interpretation guidelines for SWIGDAM say, here's 28 pages on how to interpret DNA mixtures. Not exactly all of the numbers that you need to do, but the general process. These are the methods. These are, this is the statistical framework. Or you can use computer software. Like that's, that's paraphrasing, but that's what it is. You do it this way or your own way if, if a program does it. So now we have uh, probabilistic genotyping that is not taking their lead from the protocols that you guys have gotten from the laboratory. They are written software programs that are doing whatever they do. So this is the combination of biological modeling, statistical theory, computer algorithms, and probability distributions to calculate likelihood ratios and or infer genotypes. So some of these systems can actually not just look in a mixture and say, yeah, this guy could be in it. They can say, I think these people are in it. I think these particular genotypes came together and made this messy mixture. And uh, that's, I mean, it's an awesome idea. And it's super cool that we have computers that can do that now. Um, is the actual process reliable enough for a courtroom is the, the question that you guys are interested in, right? You, you know my answer, but because um, I'm here all excited talking about it. 
So beforehand, uh, a lot of analyses that we would do for a single locus is, okay, well, alleles 15, 17, and 18 are present. Even if they look like this, uh, the old methods of traditional interpretation and some probabilistic genotyping systems did not think about peak heights. Clearly, the 17 and the 18 are better matches to each other than that 15 is with either of them because uh, contributor amounts. You know, if we're trying to figure out a major contributor, if we're saying we think one guy is the major contributor, that 17 and the 18 make more sense to go together. But uh, you can explain alternative explanations. Uh, that's what probabilistic genotyping is trying to suss out. What are the various combinations uh, in which we can, we can combine different genotypes to explain the data that we see on our computer screen or on our printout in our electropharogram. And uh, it takes a lot of guesses. Excuse me, some of these systems will go through millions of guesses of checking to see if various explanations are reasonable. That's millions of guesses. How do you check if those guesses were reasonable in the first place? And if the guesses that it thought were reasonable or OK, that it used to tally up some score, were actually reasonable or OK. And so the, the ability to inspect these systems is uh, lacking. True Allele is a Pennsylvania software program that is one of the, the two commercial systems in the United States, probabilistic genotyping systems. StarMix is the other one. I don't know which is more likely to hit Philly first. Um, so if you see either of these, these buzzwords, my phone number is on the last slide. Hey, hey Nathan, what do I do? And like, I, I'm not here to sell you guys any stuff. I'm not going to charge you for a phone call, like what's my next step kind of thing. And, and do call me if you have questions, or, or send me an email and say, hey, do you have slides? Do you have videos? More resources for anything, because I've got to wind this down. But uh, briefly, the lab will get the software. They will do their validation study of lab-made mixtures. And then based on those results, they'll say, OK, we're ready for casework. That's, that's how it goes. I've never seen a lab fail a validation study. I've seen a lab fail a part of a validation study is the closest that I've, I've come to see that. Yeah, uh, True Allele and StarMix have come up with uh, different answers are expected, but seriously different answers. Seriously different. Right. Yeah. So if one, one comes up with a million statistic and the other one comes with a, a 200,000, I'm not going to point and say, oh my gosh, they're, they're so different. Because we deal with numbers that are so large and with such great degrees of uncertainty that you can't quibble about an order of magnitude. You can't quibble about something being 10 times larger than another number. Yeah, m right. many labs that adopt these systems will, for those, those straightforward mixtures where you're at single source or if it's one guy's way high signal, and that's the profile you're trying to, to figure out who that is. Many labs will still do that traditionally. They will not put it into one of these automated systems. Uh, I do want to leave you with the language. And I don't know how many more slides. I got five more slides. I don't. OK. So this is language that you guys should home in on, because it might come quietly to your lab. The lab's just online one day with a radically new system. One million times more likely if uh, than if. These, these are different phrasings than the statistical conclusions that you're used to seeing with random match probabilities and, and the, the CPI statistic. So one million times more probable coincidental match, these are language taken from reports of StarMix and Trulial. These are the, the phrasings that come with the system effectively, that in their trainings that, that they put on, they will, they will teach these ways to report out the statistic. I do want to, to mention this briefly. If you ever see a verbal scale for a likelihood ratio, where a likelihood ratio is, is generally represented as some number above one, it's no longer a one in blank number, but it's simply a million times more likely or one trillion times more probable. Many labs have adopted this concept of doing a qualitative equivalent to a number. 
So if you hit a one likelihood ratio, it's uninformative. And then anything above that, they have this scale. This is made up. <laughs> there is no scientific basis for the idea that nine is weak and 10 is moderate. I haven't seen a whole lot of successful fights against this, but this is definitely something that, you know, if, if somebody's like, well, I don't really know how big a million is, but I do know what extremely strong is, who's to say that extremely strong or, or maybe moderate is not a better representative uh, qualitative equivalent to a million? Like, I don't even know how you construct a study to test people's perceptions of moderate versus a million. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> and, and I think it's a very big, big difference if some person, some analyst is saying, you know, that's some, some significant support for something. This is a table on a report with the lab's heading on it. You know, it looks all, if they're saying offhand, you know, like, I've seen bigger numbers, I've seen small numbers, this is kind of in the middle. Um, I, I have less problems with that than portraying this as some sort of, you know, we have, it, it looks scientific, right? Numbers in a table. So, oh yeah, and it, it wasn't used with random match probabilities or CPI that your labs used to use. So they just started adopting this when they brought on likelihood ratios. Why weren't, like, we didn't just come up with the word weak. So um, exclusions using probabilistic genotyping seem to be less rare. So oftentimes they will report out a statistic in support of exclusion. But nowadays when you're reading reports, you'll often see so-and-so is excluded from a sample. That's less likely. So you, you'll likely see that embedded in the likelihood ratio language. But it will support the hypothesis that that person is excluded. So there's going to be changes to that as well. And I'm sure that's something that you guys were happy to see when your guy wasn't, you know, maybe he was on the suitcase handle, but not the gun inside or something like that. Yeah, he was excluded from the gun. Now he might not be excluded from the gun. He might be, you know, 6,000 times more likely that it's a random and unrelated individual than it is so-and-so, which is less clear, yeah. Um, so the software quality, and, and I'm, I'm so sorry that, that we're going into the, the break and over, but this is great. This is out of uh, the OCM in New York City. I just got this last month. So they wrote their own probabilistic genotyping system. And after validation, they had some programmers update functions. Like that, that should, I, I'm looking around at you guys like you should be aghast. But as, as a computer person, you validate a piece of software and then you go in and you change it. This isn't, we're not talking iPhones. We're not talking, you know, Netflix needs to download an update before you can watch your movies again. This is a program that's supposed to evaluate a scientific process. And I don't, how, I don't know how much you can sort of talk about this, but just so everyone knows, for probabilistic genotyping, the actual code, the program that they're running this through to spit out these numbers that are make no sense, you know, the code has been held very closely. Mark, uh, Mark Perlin over at True Allele, that up until very recently, you couldn't even look at that code at all. Um, they're saying all this code has been proprietary information. So there's been a lot of really interesting litigation just on the very front end of these cases, just to get the code to know what it is the output even means. Um, I know through, actually through Nathan, some of Nathan's work in federal court in New York, which is how they kind of found out about some of this stuff, where they finally actually got access to the code. Because um, federal courts understand protective orders, um, where state courts, judges sort of look at you like you have three heads when you start saying stuff like that. Um, so there has been a lot of work even before you're getting to the interpretation problem. Usually the litigation in these cases starts at trying to get access to the source code. Um, so whether or not it's true allele or star mix. Now, I know recently, and I haven't heard of anybody yet, but I know the question's been going around because I think for true allele programs, there's been some like for a certain fee, you can now maybe see all of that stuff. Um, 
I haven't been in litigation recently to know what it, if anybody's got to look at it. But that is coming because this lit because I think largely what has happened in New York. Um, so things to keep an eye out for if this starts coming in your way in Philly. Yeah. Nathan, Nathan's probably better answer that question. Uh, source code for Starmix. Um, it is available for review. I'll you, right? Since since me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This blame him. Um, so I, I reviewed uh, a version that I can't talk about. I'm under a non-disclosure agreement, and despite their concerns, I don't violate those. Um, that has been it, an earlier version than what's been used in the United States has been reviewed. So even if I could talk about it, it it's not relevant because it's not the version that's being used. So um, True Allele does have that policy now um, that you, you got to talk to them to see what the policy actually is. Uh, and FST in New York City has has been reviewed as well. And uh, somebody posted it online. So now anybody can look at it. So the, the significance of this is after validation, the programmers changed the code, changed, un, made things inadvertent changes, and that affected the way that the numbers were being sorted, uh, which is a big deal when you're working in computer programs. The way that your numbers are arranged is pretty much the entirety of your program. Um, they ended up not being able to fix their mistakes, had to bring a contractor back in, and then the contractor ended up doing whatever they did. And this happened in April, May, or June of 2011. And we found out about it last month. Yeah. So 1,600 cases later. So that that's great. <laughs> this is this is my picture of of a catastrophic failure of a rocket, and it's a, a poor screen capture. This happened in 1996. The Ariane 5 rocket explosion happened because of software updates that weren't appropriately vetted beforehand. So, like 150 million dollars worth of satellites were lost on this. It was unmanned. So there's Thankfully, like I'm not showing some poor guy blowing up. Um, but we know that this rocket failed because it turned into a big fireball. And we don't know that FST had been changed because all it did was output a different number. So is that number better or worse is ultimately the question. They're saying that it's not a big deal, even though it is a different number. So if you're the guy on the other end of that number, it seems like it would make a very big difference. And, and really, the root of the problem is they made a change without studying how that change affected the performance of the system uh, across all relevant potential casework samples. Well, did, did that come up in, in a second validation study? No. I mean, so, so how was it discovered? That's my question. We got the source code and looked at it. Oh, all right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There, there was a lot of back and forth litigation in federal court, and that's Chris Flood at the Federal Defenders in New York who did that litigation. Um, and it was very interesting. I mean, like you said, it's now online because eventually uh, ProPublica was sort of following the litigation. And once it got released um, under the protective order, they kind of made a big deal about it. And it's like, why, well, why can't this be a public document? Um, so there's been a, there was a ProPublica story that also followed that particular piece of litigation and whether or not this should be open source type thing. Um, but in Chris, I'm, I'm sure Chris would share the pleadings. I'm not sure if I have them currently on my computer, but that's one, you know, protective orders. One like um, there's a, been a couple of different approaches across the country um, to try to get at this source data, um, and I don't want to go through all of them now. But there's there's certainly a couple of ways to approach trying to get the source data. Um, and like I said, the one successful, more recent successful one was the one in federal court in New York. So my last thing that I'll, I'll leave you guys with is we had the three pages 
of SWGDAM's interpretation guidelines in 2000, then it turns out we really needed 28 pages worth in 2010. And then here we are in 2017, it turns out we need 90 pages. So this sounds like an evolving field, that it's immature. We haven't gotten to the point where we're confident in the processes that we're actually using. If you need to come back later and say, you know what, there's a better way to do this, then it sounds like we've been doing it a not so great way beforehand. So there are materials out there describing how to do some parts of this. Of course, there's, there's no forensic DNA standard setting body that everybody's ignoring, but there are, at least for the probabilistic genotyping systems, the software solutions to these complex mixtures, there are appropriate ways to put that type of software together. And they're codified by groups like the Association for Computing Machinery. This is an organization that, like, it's a weird name because it's so old back when we had like vacuum tubes and mechanical calculators and stuff. And the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Between these two organizations, there's like a half million people who are professional engineers who develop complex systems every day and have developed standards for how to do this. And the way that they don't do it is update several functions and inadvertently make changes for systems that we would consider to be critical, where mistakes that are simply a change in the number are not easy to detect because it's just a different number. So the, the immaturity of the forensic DNA field that I think is, is fairly apparent because we keep having to go back to describe how what we used to be doing wasn't so great could really take some cues from established engineering disciplines, but they haven't. And that's my biggest concern, because we're getting even farther away from being able to easily explain why a particular conclusion is the way it is if a computer's doing it, as opposed to an analyst that you can talk to and ask them and confront them when they do something wrong. If you don't know the computer did something wrong, then you're not going to know the answer to ask the question. But if you do know it did something wrong, how do you confront it? How, how, do you, how do you tell it it's wrong and see what its response to that is? So that's, that's my uh, big thing right now, is that we don't have these fireballs, and uh, we're not getting easy access to the, to the code, to the development materials, to reasons why we should trust these systems.